perfect sacrifice without spot, without blemish. The Bible says that he knew no sin. There's one, one news anchor said recently something along the lines that Jesus was not perfect or something like that. Well, we know he's not reading the Bible. Um, whatever. Jesus Christ was perfect and is perfect. So, doesn't matter what people say or think. But anyway, it's good to be back in the house of the Lord. Thankful for each one of us here this morning. I'm going to read a few verses of scripture, which comes from the book of Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 13. And it's just a few little verses. I'm going to read verses 8, 9, and 10. Then I have a companion text, which comes from 1 John. But Romans chapter 13, starting at verse 8, where the Apostle Paul declared, O no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Then I'm going to use a verse which comes from 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Yes, amen. And I'm preaching on a thought or title this morning. With the help of the good Lord, the fundamentals of love. The fundamentals of love. Reverend Palmer, please pray, sir. Father, this morning we thank you for the reading of your word, O oh God. Continue, Lord, to have your way in our hearts and our lives by your Holy Spirit, Lord. Continue, O oh God, to break up the fellow grounds in our hearts and our lives so that we can receive all that you would have for us this morning. We ask you now to help pass and minister unto us the bread of eternal life unto your people. And we give you all the glory and the praise. In Christ's name, amen. 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 The fundamentals of love. Love is arguably one of God's greatest attributes. Therefore, he is our perfect example to follow. His love is not weird, inappropriate, or unattainable, but rather it is ripe for anyone who dares to know it. He is, or going back, God is not a lying, uh, backstabbing hypocrite that will cheat on us. He is God, and he loves every one of us despite how we treat him ourselves or others truly the world that we know today would be a better place if they exercise the fundamentals of love mercy grace and forgiveness are the fundamentals of God's love I recognize there can be some other things shared but I'm endeavoring to keep it simple I was praying this morning I had a a good idea of where I was going to be at this morning talking about the subject of love. And it seemed good to the Lord to talk to, uh, to you this morning from the book of Romans. But I'm going to expand on it, but at the same time endeavor to keep it simple. The first fund uh, fundamental we're going to look at is mercy. And we find throughout the scriptures, without encompassing a whole lot, because there's a story I want to focus on here, but it's, st it's still good to make mention of it, and that is throughout the word of God, we see his mercy, which is love. Now, when it comes to love, mercy, grace, forgiveness, really there is no, you, you can't separate them because that's, God is so, so big and, and so extensive. When it comes to these fundamentals, you really cannot separate them. So it's no wonder why many of these things will go hand in hand together. But I want to look at mercy and talking about this woman in the Bible who we don't know her name, just simply refers to her as the woman that was caught in adultery. 
from the book of John chapter 8. And many of us are familiar with this story, how that she was caught, the Bible tells us, in the very act. And there was nothing merciful about how they apprehended this woman because really it was a trap from the beginning. And there was no mention of the man that was um, with her at this time. And so the Bible tells us as they brought this woman to Jesus, Jesus was, he was teaching like he would normally do. And the Bibles, they, they begin to ask this question. They tell, they ask the question in John chapter 8, verse 5. It says, now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. That goes without saying. That's just the way that it is. There's going to be, there has to be a penalty for sin. There has to be some kind of punishment when we go against the word of God. And so they asked the question, but what do you say? And really, of course, this was a trap. They were tempting him. And at that particular time, the Lord didn't say anything. He continued to write on the ground as if he didn't even hear them. But he was going to show them something which they knew nothing about. He was going to show them this fundamental of his love, and that is mercy. Aren't you glad this morning for the mercy of God? We all need his mercy. Without his mercy, we, we too would be lost. So Jesus, when he finally spoke up, he said, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone or let him cast a stone at this woman. And they already had their stones gathered and they began to let them down or throw them on the ground and they, they left the woman alone. And Jesus says, um, where are those uh, that, uh, that have accused you? Has any man condemned thee? The Bible tells us in verse 11 of John chapter 8, she said, no man, Lord. Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. God was showing us uh, what mercy is like firsthand. We didn't have to necessarily hear it from someone else, but we're hearing it from God. I would say even now uh, that he is the true merciful one. Perhaps when we should have been thrown away, cast to the side, and judged accordingly, the Lord stepped in right on time uh, like he normally does, and, and mercy intercedes for us once again. The psalmist declared in Psalm 118, verses 1 through 4, he said, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. His mercy talks about goodness, kindness, faithfulness, beauty, favor, or pity. The psalmist also declared in Psalm 103, verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Many times people will lie on God and say that it's God's fault why all these things are going on wrong in their lives, not realizing what the scripture tells us, that his mercy endureth forever. The times when we should have been judged appropriately, the mercy of God interceded once again. When we should have been dead and on our way to hell, the mercy of God intercedes for us again. Yeah. Talking about the fundamentals of love. From mercy, we go on to grace. Grace is that unmerited favor. Now, mind you, in the commandments or the law here, now this is reiterated. It was talked about in the Gospels, but of course it was talked about in the book of Exodus and I believe even in the book of Deuteronomy. So some of these things obviously are still good for us today. It has not changed. It really hasn't. So he says that for this, in verse 9, thou shalt not commit adultery. He never said to keep on doing it. God understands and because he's a merciful God, it's okay. It's, that's not what he says. He says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. To bear false witness is to tell lies. Lies are still wrong in the eyes of God. Regardless of what people in the world think or say, it's still wrong. He says, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this, saying namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So God still puts these in his words or is still applicable for us today. But looking at grace, that unmerited favor, Paul writing in the book of Romans chapter 5, he says in verses 19 and 20, For as by one man's disobedience, he's talking about Adam, many were made sinners. 
So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Talking about Christ. He says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And then he, of course, he went on to say, going on into chapter 6, he says, shall we continue to live in sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid. So we understand and realize that Adam and Eve, they messed up. And this is how sin entered into the world. But he says, by another person's obedience, God did what? He made it a, a, a way for us to, to be saved. He made a way for us to obtain uh, this, uh, this righteousness. It's only by his grace uh, today that we are saved. Amen. Ephesians, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So grace is very applicable for us today. Again, these things go hand in hand. That woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, the Lord was not only merciful to her, but he was gracious as well. Amen. He understood that according to the law, she was supposed to die. According to the law, there, hey, this is it. It's cut and dry. And when you think about what they did to this woman, it was a setup from the very beginning. Where's the mercy? Where's the grace? Where's the man? We never read anything about old boy, and it's very likely old boy was amongst those uh, Pharisees that day. We're not going to say anything. You Gucci, man. We got you. We got your back. You covered. Gucci, that's just another word saying you good. <laughs> but that's how it is in, in the world. Sinners will cover up for other sinners. Somebody was mentioning something about someone recently, and nothing was done seemingly at that time, but... This person is seemingly going to be in a lot of trouble, and rightfully so. Uh, I might just have to leave it at that. But many times in the world, sinners will cover up for other sinners. And it's just a matter of time before all that sin is exposed. The Bible says that your sin will find you out. It may not happen overnight, may not happen in a few weeks, may not even happen in a few months. It may take years for things to be uncovered. But when it does, when it finally is uncovered, and when it's all said and done, it, it, it will be exposed. Grace intercedes for us today. He said this is a gift from God. It's nothing, it's nothing that we can, we can work for. And that's the thing I love about God. He always, not only is he a personal God, but he really gives us the choice or the option. Do you want my grace? Do you want my mercy? Do you want my love? Do you want to be saved? God says, I can make a way for you. I've already provided a way. But it's up to us to accept that, that way or that challenge or, or what he has given unto us to be a gift. So we see that this mercy and grace are fundamentals. But what's the other one? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. And to understand as we look at Christ on the cross in the book of Luke chapter 23 verses 33 and 34. It says when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors or these criminals or evildoers, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Forgiveness. This is a, you know, honestly, this works or obviously it works for God. Talking about grace, mercy and forgiveness. But it can also work in a relationship. Do you realize that? I guess I may have failed to mention that in talking about this, this parallel. The parallel is, 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 is for us. It works. In a relationship, if someone, and I would say it, it doesn't matter what, what kind of a relationship it is, whether it's a parent or whether it's a, a, a spouse or a boyfriend, girlfriend, these, these attributes or these fundamentals are, are still worth uh, following. They really are. We need grace in a relationship. We need mercy in a, a relationship. We need forgiveness in a relationship. You may have done something wrong and you just got to suck up your little pride and ask that person, hey, I would like for you to forgive me. I, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I don't know what I was thinking, but can you please forgive me? I messed up. It takes a big person to admit that. I've messed up. But I love how Christ deals with this topic of forgiveness. Here he was on the cross, crucified. First of all, he didn't do anything wrong. Kind of reiterating the point that I made at the beginning. Uh, Christ is perfect. He was perfect. He knew no sin. The only wrong that was on him was the wrong of our own sins. 
of our own iniquities. It was the sins of the entire world that was placed upon his shoulders. And this is why he decided to die for every one of us so that we could have life, so that we could have freedom, so that we could experience love like never before. Amen. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Perhaps sometimes we may not under fully understand that because how could Christ say such a thing? What do you mean these people don't know what they're doing? Were they not the ones that crucified? Were they not the one to have a, this old mock trial? They, they, they sent them from judgment hall to judgment hall. They didn't want no real evidence and they had false witnesses, okay, which was against the law or the, uh, the commandments. It says thou shalt not bear false witness. They found some false witnesses. Hey, say, say that he did this or say that it did. Isn't it true that he did this? Who were these people? But they absolutely lied on him. They, they, they tortured him and they beat him beyond recognition. And on top of all of this, the Lord of glory still could say, Father, forgive them. Man, you wait till somebody run us, uh, do something wrong to us. Man, we don't even need the whole, we don't even need the whole story. Just even if we think somebody did something wrong to us. Man, we ready to just crucify them. We are ready to throw them up under the bus. Man, we're, we're, we're willing to scandalize their name across social media because why? We want the whole world to know that what was done to us was absolutely wrong. And we never take time to think about the wrong that we have done to Almighty God. And But the Lord of glory could still say, Father, forgive them. He says, for they know not what they do. In the book of Mark, chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, he says, when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses or your sins. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. That's cut and dry right there. There's no, there's no room for open interpretation. It is what it is. If I can't forgive others, God is not going to forgive me. Cut and dry. Very basic, very simple. Well, according to my calculations, I really think that that word forgive, it doesn't matter what a person is thinking. It's cut and dry. The Lord says, if you don't forgive others, I'm not going to forgive you. If I don't, if I don't obtain forgiveness, then how am I going to make it into God's kingdom? Well, God knows, he understands my heart. People say that all the time. God knows my heart, but we don't have to remind God that he knows our heart. Before the words even come out, he already knows what's in our hearts. But it's almost like people have to do this to appease their own conscience, knowing they're dead wrong, wronging in two left shoes and wronging in uh, rain in the, in, the, in the living room. Man, you wrong. But the word forgive, means to disregard, abandon, forsake, omit, or yield up. God is saying, I'm willing to disregard everything you've ever done. No matter how bad and wrong it was, I'm, I'm willing to abandon it. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to forsake it and not even think about it if a person would just admit it. God, I've messed up. I've, I've done wrong. Uh, I need your forgiveness. I need you to, to, to move in my heart. I, I, I don't want this to be in my life. God forgives. He knows how to forgive. It is to let go. This is what happens when people don't have forgiveness in their hearts. They end up becoming bitter. Bitterness is extreme wickedness, hatred, harsh, sharp, piercing, pungent. The book of Isaiah chapter 38 verse 17 says, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness. But thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. No one could ever accuse God and say that he's not a loving God. They can't say he's not merciful. They can't say he, he's not gracious. They can't say that he's not forgiving. He's the epitome of all of those things. He gave us the beautiful example when he gave us his only begotten son. He still see, he, no matter what a person has said or done, he says, I'm still willing to love them. I'm still willing to forgive them. I'm still willing to just uh, be gracious and merciful to them. Perhaps when they don't even de deserve it. Hebrews, the apostle wrote, chapter 12, follow peace, he says, with all men 
and holiness. Holiness is righteousness, right living, clean living. He says, without which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. So many people are defiled because of bitterness. They cannot let things go. They even bring it all the way from their childhood going into their adult years and they walk around with all these weights and all this heaviness and all this sin and so many burdens burdens and, and just so much they don't know how to love because there's so much bitterness and filthiness in their heart because of the things that was done to them over the years but see when God comes along is he not the burden bearer can he not relieve us from those problems and the stress and the things that easily so so easily besets us uh, can he not give us uh, true deliverance and salvation of course he can. Yeah. But see, you don't understand. Woe is me. I've been going through this my whole life. And you know, that stuff gets old after a while. Mm -hmm. It really does. It sounds like an old country song. And man, I just don't have time to listen to all the whining and that sad guitar that's going off in the background. All my friends left me. Don't know where else to go. I had a dog and the dog done left me so. Well, I'm sad as you can plainly see. Just look at my face. And you know people love that type of music? It just, because it's how they, music has a way of describing how we feel. And that's why they call it, the people who perform these songs, they are referred to as artists. Because it's a form of art. Why? Because it's how they are expressing themselves. They're letting you know that they are so sad. They're letting you know that they're going through and they're so miserable. And so many times, as is a played out cliche, but it's the truth. Misery loves company. I'm very sad and I'm going through and I just need somebody to join me. And we can be miserable together. I don't know about you, but like the old saying goes, and I don't think it was, I don't think Tyler Perry coined the phrase, but I can do bad all by myself. Why do I need somebody to join me and feeling bad? It don't make sense. I can do bad all by myself. But what happens to these people again? They're so bitter. They can't let things go. It's always someone else's fault. It's this one's fault. It's that one's fault. And then this, that, and the other. Not realizing whom the Son has set free is free indeed. God can free me of all those burdens. He can set me free in my mind. He can set me free in my soul. He can set me free. I can have this peace with, that uh, passes all understanding. I can feel the precious love of Almighty God. I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm not the same. I can be different. I can be changed. They don't know how to respond. They don't know how to, to react. But forgiveness is a fundamental of love. Now listen to this before I get to the text. In the book of Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 it says, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now we would say this was considered to be the golden rule. Of course, where did you get the golden rule from? The Bible. Other religious groups or other people may say something like this is karma. Now, Christians, we don't believe in karma. But I can't tell you how many times people actually say that. Oh, karma got him. That's not a Christian term. It's actually a term that comes from Hinduism. And the root of that word means to do. But that's not what we refer to it as in the Bible. We can use the golden rule, I suppose, or we can say there's a law of reaping and sowing. You reap for what you sow. But this is all part of that. If I want people to love me and I want people to respect me, then that means I have to do the same thing. Okay, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And it goes with the text where it says, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. 
Okay, so I'm not going to discredit someone and just purposefully try to do things to tear them down. I'm not trying to hurt anyone. I'm not trying to get on anyone's nerves. Uh, now in the army, it's an army uh, value. They call it respect. Treat others as they should be treated. Man, the world would be a better place if we could exercise more love. Okay, well, what's love? Let's break it down. God is love. If there were more Christians in the world, the world would be a better place. Well, how do I know what God's love is? He gives us this, this uh, beautiful example. I'm giving you the fundamentals. We know what mercy is. We know what grace is. We know what forgiveness is. Those are the very basics of love. How can a person not know how to love? Maybe because they're suffering from things on the inside. Still holding on to certain things. Still can't get over certain things. And love, check this out. Love is not, let me break it down two ways for you. Love is just not intimacy. I think that's part of the problem in our society today. Somehow they get it in their minds and get it all wrapped up and twisted that this is purely love. But that's not true, especially if it's not in the right relationship how God designed it. Okay, it's nothing wrong with intimacy, but it's still, of course, between a man and between a woman, and that couple should be married. But ultimately, that's not the only part of love in that aspect. And love is certainly not just, just judgment and just punishment and just getting on some people. That's not love. That is not love. Well, the Bible, didn't the Bible says that God chasteneth those whom he loves? Of course it does. But that's not all that God does. How many times do we read about, did Jesus beat up anybody in the Bible? Did he, I mean, yes, he changed out those, uh, they were gambling and whatnot in the temple, uh, exchanging stuff. He chased them out. But uh, for the most part, we really don't, read about God being so physical with the people that he encountered besides just touching them and healing them. What does that tell me? That he exercised more love than anything. He even exercised love against his own enemies. I think about it all the time. That man by the name of Malchus who was a servant and how that he was there when they arrested Jesus and Peter cut off this man's ear. He was not there to praise the Lord. He was not there to worship God. Uh, he was not there to say, oh Jesus, you're just such a great, wonderful person. He was there as a part of what they were doing and trying to uh, apprehend him. But Peter came to the Lord's defense and what did Peter do? He cut off the servant's ear. And what did Jesus do? Jesus didn't cut off the other ear. Jesus didn't stomp on the ears that were already on the ground. That's what you get, chump. You should have never came to me in the first place. You don't know who I am. I'm God. I'll always be God. Punk. That We don't read anything about that. What did Jesus do in his grace? And what did he do in his mercy? What did he do in his forgiveness? Hello. Can I get a witness this morning? Talking about the fundamentals of love. The man, what was going on? You, can you imagine the trauma that his ear was suffering from and the blood and everything was just gushing out all at once? My goodness, the man was probably in so much shock. Maybe he was starting to suffer from a headache. Maybe he was just thinking, oh, I messed up now. I am going to die. What's going on? The mercy of God interceded. The forgiveness of God interceded. The love of God interceded. The grace of God interceded. He picked up the man's ear, and the man was healed instantly. Man, can you imagine the testimony of that man? And getting right with God? Man, y'all not going to believe this. I was that one. They were talking about, you know, his disciple cut my ear off. Let like the truth be told, dude was trying to swing for my head. But I just so happened, I ducked just in time, and all he got was my ear. It could have been my whole head, y'all. But I, when I was there, man, I had all kinds of bitterness in my heart. I had all kinds of hatred. I just knew I was doing something like, yeah, we're going to get this one called Jesus. I'm about to he's God. He's walking on water. So he think he's better than all of us now? What kind of garbage is this? But man, when he healed my ear, you know, not only was I healed him physically, but I got a healing in my soul. Amen. Because my feelings changed. This yeah. is all supposition. Yeah. But could you imagine the man's testimony? Yeah. Man, I was feeling so yucky inside and just terrible inside. But man, it was something about the Savior when he came and he, he placed his hand 
on me and I just start to feel his peace. I just start to feel his love. Man, his grace and his mercy just flooded my soul. I never felt anything like this in my life. There's no drugs, there's no alcohol, there's no relationships that can come close to the love of God. Man, his love is awesome. It's different. Yes, it is. That's what makes God so appealing to so many people. His love. And you know, not a knock against other religions, honestly. I don't want to come across that way, but uh, our God is different. I, I, our God, and, and, I would, and I would say this, especially according to some, some people who were Muslims and they got converted, they got right with God, they, they gave their life over to the Lord. They, and, and their religion, they never felt that love. They never did. Why? Because maybe their God is just full of just, just judgment. And if this is done wrong to you, then you have to get back at the person. As Christians, we don't have to get back at anybody. Okay. We don't have to get say, oh yeah, well you did this to me now. I'm re-. He says, love worketh no ill toward his neighbor. And that's, not, that's, not, that's not love. Now sometimes things do come against us. Yes, I understand. Sometimes things legitimately come against us, but, but can the Holy Spirit not give us that temperance? He does. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Temperance or control. He yeah. gives me that control to where I don't have to go off on someone. And he gives me that peace to where I don't have to go on, off on someone. He gives me that love and that goodness and that kindness and that gentleness. And the list goes on and on. I don't have to just go off on someone. Why? When I was in my mess, God didn't go off on me. He never did. He didn't have to keep beating me up with the same old, same old every single day. When you gonna get right, you dirty sinner? Man, you just a hypocrite. All you do is just go through the motion. No, it's a, it's a gentle tug. I'm dealing with you. When you gonna get right? When you gonna finally let it all go? When you gonna finally just kneel at, the, at a good old fashioned altar and just give it over to the Lord? When you gonna finally just give in and stop being so rebellious? When are you going to finally just say enough is enough and stop going through the motions? That's how God deals with us. It's a gentle tug. He never yanks on us. Well, 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 how could you say such a thing? Because he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That yoke is easy. He don't tie it around your neck and choke you until where you can't breathe no more. How many times am I gonna tell you to get saved? Okay, Lord, I believe. <laughs> Some people, that's all they understand. That's all they understand is a whooping. That's all they understand is somebody getting on them. That's all they understand is, but that's not the, that's not really the love of God, the whole picture. It really isn't. Love is just not a bunch of rules and regulations. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do this. This church stuff is boring. It's just too many. Who, who, who enters into a relationship like that? Now, I will say, when it comes to the instruments, now, I will say, if you are in a relationship, and you feel like that, yeah, your relationship is in trouble. Now, that's just the straight up truth. Where you just feel like you can't breathe and you can't do this and you can't do that. And everybody's always finding fault with you or whatever the case may be. But in a, in a, in a good relationship, it's not like that. It's what I want to do. I want to help the other person. I want to be a blessing to the other person. I want to be their friend. And I'm not talking out the side of my neck. I'm talking from experience. Before I got saved, I was in a relationship for a long time. And that was not a relationship I ever wanted to be in again. So when I got right with God, why would things change? Now, now I'm, in, I'm doing this thing the right way. I'm in a right relationship. God has ordained it. God has blessed it. So why would I mistreat my spouse? Some people say, I love you, I love you. They don't know how to talk to you. They're always critical. It's almost like they can't wait to find fault with everything you do. Man, you can't even blow your nose good. You miss something. Something's still hanging from your nose. Well, why don't you get it then? <laughs> can't, you can never do anything right. Can't wake up right. Took you too long to get up. 
Mm. Can't eat right. Why you have to always smack when you eat? I can't, I can't do nothing right, man. What's going on? But see, in the right relationship with God, I'm not doing this for myself, like just trying to make a name for myself. And I'm really not out to please everyone else around me. I'm here to please one, and that's Almighty God. Amen. Let God be true and every man a liar. Yes. You think what you want to think. But I know my relationship is right with God. I, I came to him while there was time. I didn't waste my life and say, oh, I'm just going to go through and just do. No, I gave my life to the Lord and, and that settled it. And I started to experience his love like never before. His mercy, his grace, his forgiveness. Church, it don't get no more simple than that. It really doesn't. Whatever you may be going through, whatever you may be facing, why don't you just declare it right now? Before I leave today, I know the service is almost over, but before I leave today, and I'm not going to blow the altar call and just go to the restroom or just shoot out there, but no, I'm going to stay. And I'm going to get a breakthrough in my soul. I'm not going to leave like, like how, how, how Jacob would say when he was wrestling with that angel of the Lord, I, I'm God or the Lord, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I'm going through some tough things right now, and God, I'm not going to let you go. I didn't come this far to turn back and go the other way. Because if it was so good out there, then I would have never left. But because I was miserable, and because I was lost and undone, and on my way to hell, the Lord of glory stepped in right on time. It's up to you this morning how you live. It's up to you this morning how you leave. But I'm telling you this morning, as the Holy Spirit is my witness, you can be changed today. Yes. It's up to you what you want to do. Yes. Choice is yours. I preach what I felt the Lord laid on my heart. It's up to you to receive it and stop going through the motions and deceiving everyone else and deceiving yourself. Declare it. I'm going to get a blessing in my soul. I'm going to leave out better than when I came in. I'm going to get what I have need of. It's me standing in the need of prayer. Yes, these other ones may have a need, but the Lord, he can help me in my time of need. I need the Lord to do a work in my life. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning in reverence to the Lord. Let God do something miraculous in your soul today. And leave this church lighter. Like God has absolutely removed that burden from you. Removed that sin as far as the east is from the west. Oh, God can do it in your life this morning, church. Whoever has a need, whoever's going through, whoever, maybe you just want to give God some praise. Let the Lord hear it this morning. The altar is open. Let's all find a place to pray and spend time with God.